I think, um, perhaps try and get some idea of, uh, of my thought processes when I actually started um, to do this. As uh, Mike mentioned, the um, majority of my photography tends to be underwater or has been in the past. And um, I obviously tend to keep a minimal amount of kit when I'm, uh, when I'm doing that, or well, clearly not. Um, and so uh, because I was doing underwater photography quite a lot, um, at one stage I ended up in New Zealand and a friend of mine had arranged for me to do a tandem uh, glide session in Queenstown in New Zealand. And um, he really actually arranged it because he, he, he wanted to scare me senseless. There's a, there's a long history there going way, way back to the 80s um, where I was party to um, um, a little bit of an accident with him. And he decided as revenge in 2003, I think this was, uh, he would try and scare me. Um, and so he arranged tandem paragliding I didn't have the heart to tell him at the time that actually I was thinking about taking up paragliding. So when I, it was time to do that tandem um, jump, I asked the instructor um, or the pilot, tandem pilot whether I could take a camera with me. And he said, yes, that's fine. Um, and it had occurred to me that if I did take up paragliding, that's probably the reason why I'd want to do it. And so we did the flight. Uh, he was rather surprised when I turned up with a Nikon uh, D, uh, uh, sorry, a Nikon F4, which is a rather large brick. Um, but I did actually manage to get this picture. So essentially, this is the first um, aerial photograph I ever took. Um, and this is uh, just over this town with the, the mountain range, the Remarkables in the background. So as far as I was concerned, it was a uh, proof of concept. And um, I enjoyed the flight and I realized I could take photos. So I thought, well, game on. Um, let's learn to paraglide and let's start, let's start taking pictures. I learned to paraglide in India. And then I thought, well, okay, what kind of camera should I be using? Well, as you saw previously, um, my underwater camera system is quite robust, but it probably isn't very practical in terms of carrying on a paraglider. So that was clearly L. But what I did have was some old underwater cameras, um, which fulfilled a lot of the uh, requirements that I thought I would need. Uh, this one was my very first underwater camera. Um, it's actually made in, I think, about 1969. Still functions, and I've still got it. Of course, I wasn't using it in 1969. Um, but the important thing here is that it's a very, very robust camera made out of metal. And the other really important thing is that all of the controls are easily accessible with gloves. And that was one of the things I realized that I was really going to need for an underwater camera. This is entirely manual though, um, as it would have been in 1968. So uh, the actual taking of the pictures is guesswork. And of course it's a film camera as well. I thought this would be a great camera at least to start aerial photography. Um, as I say, it has all the controls easily um, manipulated by gloves. Um, it's, I knew that it needed to be robust from my uh, first flights. I knew that uh, there was going to be tumbles. I needed something that was actually going to be able to take all the rough and tumble of, of paragliding. But the one thing that turned out to be a bit of a problem with this particular camera, because it was designed to be taken underwater and it was designed actually as a as the name might imply it was a it was de um, designed by a, a collaboration between Nikon the camera makers and Jacques Cousteau the famous underwater explorer and um, documentary maker but the thing about this camera is that it's it 
it's held together underwater and the seal that stops the water from coming out is on the top here. There is nothing holding it in when you're diving with it except water pressure. There's no ring seal just around here. And then to reload the film, you just pop it out. These lugs here that you can see, they go under here and you push it out. Now, problem with that is it's great underwater when you've got pressure of water above you, um, keeps, it up, keeps it closed, great. But it obviously wasn't particularly good for paragliding because instead of the pressure increasing um, on a really nice warm day, the pressure actually decreases and this doesn't stay well seated and therefore the, ca uh, the, the film carriage mechanism inside doesn't necessarily stay behind the lens. So it clearly wasn't a, a particularly good option. Luckily, I was still using another, another Nikonos or Nikon system this one, which is an Econos 5. And uh, this has a electronic metering for a start. So it's not, uh, not completely manual. And it has a latch locking system with an O-ring seal, obviously for underwater use. It has the same kind of lens system. Everything is uh, you know, really chunky and easy to, to use with gloves. And that's really one of the most important things. Um, I, I really thought that um, you know, whatever camera I have, it had to, had to have some kind of um, easy access to all the controls, not least to be able to turn it on. And in this case, you can actually lock um, the camera so you can't accidentally uh, take a picture, which is pretty critical within film cameras days because you only had 36 pictures to take and then you essentially you take no more pictures. So this was my first, uh, first go. And uh, this is in uh, taking off in the Dead Sea in Israel. Um, I think uh, probably the best part of 100 meters or 200 meters actually below sea level, um, you actually take off and then you end up on the on the shores of the Dead Sea, which I think is about 300 meters below sea level. So quite unique, actually, you're flying below sea level. Um, and uh, I was actually quite pleased with the, you know, with the pictures that, that I took. I also um, went into the Negev Desert as well, had a few little flies around and took some reasonable pictures. But it quickly became apparent to me that the camera was actually a bit heavy. I was having, I was holding it around my neck. I was starting to get a little bit worried that if, if, if there was a bit of a tumble, I'd probably knock my teeth out with it. And of course, at this stage, um, digital photography was coming into, uh, into its own. So I figured that I could probably find something uh, equally as good, if not better. And actually, this is the camera that I ended up with. Um, I did actually consider camera phones at one stage, and I know that some people are sort of thinking about those and they're getting better and better, but so far I've never actually been able to operate um, a camera phone um, on a paraglider with thick gloves. Um, so I bought this, which is a Canon G10, which is uh, I think bought in 2008. Um, and this one actually recently died. It died in um, 2020, last year. So I got quite a lot of use out of it, and you can see that I, it's quite battered. Um, but there's a number of reasons why I went with this. Now, I'm not, I have no, um, no affiliation with Canon. In fact, this is the first Canon I ever bought uh, rich, uh, uh, when I was doing work. All my other cameras are Nikon uh, and Fujifilm. Um, but uh, this particular Canon was just on the market and it was a build as a prosumer. So it's, it's G10, there were other iterations before it. But it had a lot of features, which um, I'm just gonna go through now because whichever camera you decide to buy, I think these, these are the things that you should be thinking about. So the first thing is that uh, you can get a, a reasonable case. Um, seems, you know, seems, pretty obvious, but um, you know, in many cases, that a lot of the cases that are provided, um, whether aftermarket or whether they're provided by the manufacturer themselves, sometimes aren't really up to the task. You really need a case that you can pull off so that you've got the sleeve that still protects the camera, but the thing that goes over the lens and things can actually be taken off because it's going to get in the way when you're going to be flying. So you need a two-part case. The other thing that uh, I really thought about was that um, that I needed to be able to take pictures one-handed. I'd already perfected the art of uh, steering, holding both my brakes, 
um, when I needed to take a picture. Um, and it just needed to be com comfortable in the hands and all of the controls are pretty much there, pretty much with your thumb and the finger. And it's not too heavy to just be able to pick up and then just uh, just fire away. The other thing is that it it, it ha absolutely hadn't been hadn't it needed not to be as heavy as the previous cameras I was I was talking about there because they were really heavy on the neck. I needed something that was light but not too light. Um, that was fairly critical as well. Uh, it, it hung down from my neck. That's where I wanted the camera to be, um, and it stayed there. But it it didn't start ripping my neck, and um, it was you know, fairly nice, fairly nicely nestled in front of me, which uh, which was seemed to me to be the the best kind of thing for these kind of cameras. And these are the things that really clinched it for me in terms of this particular camera. Um, it's metal construction. As I say, it was it was sold as a prosumer camera. So professionals would use this as a, as a backup if everything went horribly wrong. Um, and so they made it fairly, you know, fairly robust, a nice metal construction. And then these other th three things here were also very important. They had a good shutter release button. And that means that when you half press it, exposure and focus, I'll come back to that. But you, again, you could access the, those with gloves. The on off, you could access, access that with glove. And the zoom control also was fairly easy to, to be able to manipulate with gloves. Um, I think, you know, for most people, that's, that's fairly obvious. But uh, I had tried a number of other cameras and I was actually really quite alarmed at how hard it was to actually use them with gloves. The other thing is that um, this camera is made quite robustly, but also all of the controls are fairly robust. So the, the, all of the, the major controls are sort of raised null dials, um, which is very easy again to manipulate with gloves. And it has an exposure compensation, which again, you can, you can move with gloves. The exposure compensation means that basically you can change the exposure while you're in the air really, really easily without without worrying about the uh, the aperture controls or the uh, or the shutter speed and so on. You've just got one dial um, if you want to get if you want to um, increase the exposure or reduce the exposure. Now, for the uh, I think for for Mike and other people, I think a lot of people ask me what kind of settings I set it on. Well, the, the two major settings really is I set it on program mode and. I either choose an ISO of 100 or 200. Now the program, the reason for program mode, because you can see that I could also select auto, which is what most people would think would be the thing to do. You really don't want to be worrying about all the, all the controls, all the exposures and shutter speeds and things like that while you're flying. You just don't have time. So the obvious thing would be to set auto. The reason why I use program mode is because unlike auto, it doesn't pre-select an ISO. That's the sensitivity um, of the sensor. And so, and the reason for that is because these, this camera was fairly old. Once you got up to an ISO of 400 in low light conditions, you tended to get quite um, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of noise in, in the picture. So I didn't, I didn't want the camera to pre-select for me anything above 200. I found that 100, an ISO of 100 and the program mode will select all the other things um, is perfectly adequate for flying because it's quite bright. It's quite bright, quite sunny. And I say 100 is absolutely fine. When it's cloudy, I'll select 200. So program mode has always been the way to go and it's definitely worked for me. So the controls on the back, um, the one thing I set here is the exposure meter, uh, metering at evaluative. You can set spot, you can set um, uh, a sort of wider area, but evaluative actually makes a decision. It, it looks at all of the light and then tries it within the frame and then tries to balance it. And that does seem to work for me, um, but I'll come back to that. And then there's a, uh, there's a grid display, um, which um, is really useful for being able to line up the horizon. Um, that's the only reason there. So that there's so 
that's this square here, which is just displayed on the screen. And I do find that very useful. You can just switch it on or off. Um, sorry. Uh, the other thing is, and it's a choice, um, this is what one of the few cameras, small compact cameras at the time, that allowed you to, um, to use um, RAW, which is essentially a, a, a file system, which is, acts a little bit like a negative. Excuse so, me. Sorry. Hello? There's somebody in there, I don't know. Okay, let me continue. Okay, so yeah, so uh, um, this is one of the few cameras that allowed you to select um, the raw file system, which, uh, which simply means that um, when the camera takes a picture, it records and keeps all of the information. If you take a picture which is set to JPEG, the camera auto automatically makes a decision about what information you can see um, and is useful and what information is not needed and can throw away and it will compress the file and throw away the information just to keep the file size as small so you can pack a lot more onto your, onto your, um, onto your um, secure digital um, flash drive or whatever. So it's really just so that when you, you do take a picture, it's slightly overexposed, slightly underexposed. Um, the information is there and you can actually bring that back if you need to. Um, it records both the RAW and the JPEG so that um, you, can, you can just take, lift the, the, the photo off and just use it as is if that's what you want. Um, the other thing about this particular camera and this has amazed me quite a lot. It has a phenomenal battery life. It has quite chunky batteries. They last a good long time. I'm not charging the, the, um, the battery uh, every night. Uh, in fact, I'm not charging it every week a, a lot of the time. And I, I once took this away on a trip to Belize and it lasted me for a full three weeks of taking a lot of pictures. And also the aftermarket batteries you can buy are very cheap anyway. So you can ca carry a few of them with you, which is quite useful. The other thing is it's a very, um, bright LCD, which is nice, it's quite big, and critically, it's not a flip-out screen, because um, the way I was flying at the time, I pretty much thought that a flip-out screen would probably disappear fairly rapidly. And the other thing is that you can get glass screen protectors, which um, are solid, and they can stick on over the screen, and I bolt by these, um, because you have buckles and things um, flying around in, on, your, um, on your harness and so on, and that has a habit of scratching and sometimes cracking um, screens. So um, you could just buy very cheaply glass screen protectors, put those over the top, completely protected. When they break, you just replace them. And the other thing is, yes, it's bright, but in really, really bright sunshine, uh, sunshine um, those screens you can't see at all. Um, and so there's a, there's a tiny, tiny little viewfinder, um, which I find really useful. I can peer through that can't see the whole image with sunglasses. And that's the other thing is that you have sunglasses, you may not be able to see even a very bright viewfinder. Um, can't see the whole image through that viewfinder, but I can actually at least um, see the target and point it in, in the right direction. The other thing with this camera is that it has a, a, a screw off bayonet lens collar. Um, and that just means you can put on supplementary lenses, but also you can actually screw on an additional protective um, cover with a with a filter on it, um, you can get these things which are which are actually um, um, spring loaded. So when the uh, when the telephoto lens pops out, the spring loaded thing will just um, sit on top of the um, the barrel of the lens. And when it when it extends even further, the spring load just allows it to do that. So that's quite quite useful if uh, you know if you want to keep keep that lens pristine. So. I went back obviously to uh, New Zealand and this is pretty much the same picture with my, with my digital camera. And uh, I was you know, very pleased with that. But I think it's real first real test was actually in Iceland. Um, I knew that uh, it was probably going to be fairly challenging flying. And of course, as most of you know, Iceland is volcanic in nature. So I knew that there's going to be um, you know, probably some bangs and scrapes um, in, in some areas. 
uh, of, of the flying that I was doing, and indeed that that was the case. I was actually invited over by um, Anita, who's on the on the left here, um, and these the other two of um, the, the other two diving but uh, flying buddies that uh, I went with, and they were um, uh, very um, knowledgeable of the area, but actually paragliding was only just starting there was a really really keen um community of paragliders in Reykjavik but um it was fairly obvious that they hadn't really done a lot of exploring at that stage I'm sure they have now but the one thing that um did actually happen was that uh when we were flying I took a few tumbles and at one point in the very very sharp lava and so on I got a bit of a dragging ripped some of my clothes um, didn't break any of my lines or didn't rip, it, didn't rip my glider, but the camera did bounce over um, lava and pretty much stayed, well, completely intact, didn't seem to bother it at all. So I, I, you know, my choice of the camera I thought was vindicated, um, very robust. And in fact, after the bouncing, I just took off and um, this is the picture I took. Um, worked perfectly. The other thing I would say uh, is that. Um, just for interest, is that um, that paragliding community in, in Reykjavik, so they have a really nice site just outside for evening soaring. Um, this is it here. Um, and I think they put down a bit of astroturf as well over the uh, over the sharp sort of solidified lava. Um, and, and so it's a little bit like a, like a Reykjavik, Reykjavik version of Hill End, I suppose. Um, they just go out in the evenings and uh, have a great time. And sometimes you'll have uh, 20 to 30 gliders up, up on that uh, up on that little ridge, and of course, it's quite scenic overlooking Reykjavik. The other, oh yes, the other thing I would say um, in uh, in Iceland is that it does have the advantage in summer that you can actually go out for a sneaky midnight soar as well. Obviously, the land of the midnight sun, which is uh, which is a bit of a bonus. Um, the other um, point at which I kind of really thought that I picked a reasonable camera for the job is on an occasion where I flew from Ben Laws um, across into Ben Lyon or Glen Lyon um, and I headed for a nice little cloud um, parked myself underneath it just uh, got, got some nice lift started to head off out and then suddenly I couldn't go anywhere and the long and short of it is I ended up inside that cloud for 20 minutes. Took off from um, Ben Laws, I think in about 20 degrees, it was quite a warm day. Um, but once in that cloud, the inevitable happened and uh, it, the temperature dropped very, very rapidly. Um, you know, at this stage, I was, I was desperately trying to uh, speed bar my way out. Um, but, what then happened was that everything froze. I got completely covered in ice. My camera got completely covered in ice. Um, and after 20 minutes, I eventually popped out to probably one of the most glorious um, scenes I've ever seen. I think I might have actually been able to see both the North Sea and the Atlantic Ocean at the same time. I think my, my GPS was telling me that I was just short 10,000 feet in the air at that stage. Um, but sadly, I don't have any pictures of it because I pressed the on button for the camera and it didn't work. And I thought, okay, that's, that's probably pushed the envelope a little bit. Um, it, you know, it's broken because what had happened was that it frozen solid, had ice all over it, popped out the side of the cloud, and then everything um, was just covered in water. I was completely soaked, the camera was completely soaked. As the uh, as the ice melted almost instantly. Um, however, after about two to three minutes, I tried again, and the camera then just carried on working perfectly. The barrel had got stuck. Um, there had been water in the barrel of the lens; it wouldn't let it. It wouldn't let it come out. But then, once it warmed up a little bit, it worked fine. And I was actually able to take this picture. So I don't, by this time, I'd lost a lot of height, and I didn't get that amazing vista. But hell, the camera was working, so that was good. One of the things I've noticed um, as I was starting to take photographs was that I actually was encountering a problem which I had encountered previously when I was underwater, which is that 
you quite often have a very bright, um, high contrast environment. So you have the upper part of the picture you're taking very, very bright sunlight, um, and the lower part is often in shadow, either the ground or in, in this case with the underwater photograph. I would counteract that when I'm close to it, something with all of those massive great flash units you saw in some of the previous pictures. But in some cases, when I pull back, I have the same problem underwater as when I'm flying. And so I just use the same method that um, I've used previously. Now, one of the things I would say, I, I showed this picture previously, this camera here, the manufacturers, Nikon, must have talked to a lot of divers um, when they made and designed this. Because what they did do with the metering system, um, as I say, this was made with electronics in it. What they did do with this is that they adjusted the metering system so it was lower center weighted. So there was a bias towards metering lower than normal, lower than a normal camera. And, uh, and I, I sort of thought, well, how can I, how can I mirror this when I'm taking um, photographs in the air? And actually, I'd, I'd realized I'd already solved that problem when I, had some, when, when I was doing it underwater. Essentially, what I do is, you'll, remember, you'll recall when I was showing the top part of my camera that um, the shutter release button, as like most cameras, has a half depress, which means that when you half depress it, it activates both the focus and the exposure metering. And so it focuses and decides what kind of light level there is. So when you frame the photo, it, if you've got it on evaluative, it takes up all of the light and makes a decision and it essentially is targeting the middle of the screen. However, with a, with a very bright sky, um, when it takes a picture, the sky is going to be nice and blue, but the, the rest of this is, all go, is going to be pretty much in darkness. The green starts to go, starts to tend towards black. So the, the strategy I employ here is, is, to, is to lower my camera and then, and then half depress the camera on something that's relatively dark or somewhere that's something that's just sort of well below the horizon. Half depress it. It will focus perhaps on something a bit closer, but this is a long way away, so it's still infinity. It doesn't matter. What you're trying to do is, is just fool it into um is to, into adjusting the exposure so half to press and then lift the camera reframe for the picture that you actually wanted to take and then take the picture and that seems to work quite well for me um you just i did mention that it also has an exposure compensation dial so i could do that i could dial in um a little bit back and and make it darker that way but the trouble i found that the trouble with that is that i forget and then everything is uh, is is uh, overexposed when I take more pictures. But, and it's the same here. This the, uh, these pictures are in Austria, by the way, um, somewhere near Innsbruck. And uh, uh, this may be the highest I've I've ever been. I think this was something over, slightly over ten thousand feet. Um, but again, um, I had to use the same kind of strategy. Um, you know, this time I managed to get a nice blue sky. But it, it, uh, being up very high, probably. A, uh, um, you know, a lot of extraneous light flying around. It was very difficult to, uh, to, to balance that. And again, I've used the same kind of strategy here, uh, which is looking down um, towards Balahulish and, and, and Glencoe Village. Um, okay, not a very bright sky, but actually um, it can be quite deceptive. And uh, I, I ended up with uh, my first photos, actually, um, the, the ground coming out really, really dark. And so I had to start playing around with where I pointed the camera and getting the right exposure before actually taking a picture. Um, and indeed the same here, you can see that the sky is actually slightly washed out, but I don't mind, I, I, and this is um, Glen Etim, I think, um, I don't mind because what I really wanted was the, was the ground um, um, to be nicely exposed. 
Um, it's quite late in the day as well, so you do get these you know, really extreme contrasts and harshness of life. So, um, a lot of people tell you there's lots of rules with photography, and I, and I would uh, I would say in aerial photography, forget about it, don't worry about it, um, whatever whatever makes you happy. But there are a couple of things I do adhere to. Um, uh, quite a long time ago, I did a I did a BBC course because we were doing some um, some filming out in the Philippines, and they'd given us a camera and they wanted to make us a little documentary. So I went through this little course, and one of the things that I always remember is the rule of thirds which is um, if you've got some kind of um, focal point uh, for your picture, don't put it in the middle, put it slightly to one side because then it kind of draws the eye and tells a bit of a story as in this case. So the, you know, the glider pilot is, is on that third line, third in, um, and, and, and they're obviously looking out to the scenery. It just gives you a, a, a it, 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 it creates a little bit of a story um, and makes it a bit more interesting to view. The other um, uh, uh, rule that I tend to try and stick to, if I possibly can, is that I try to make sure that um, when I take a picture, I take a picture with the light over my, or the sun over my shoulder. Trying to take pictures directly into sunlight means everything gets washed out. And if that means that uh, I see something, um, you know, a nice piece of landscape, which is a little bit washed out, I'll actually wait until I've flown on a little bit further and I can turn around a little bit and take the picture. Um, as I say, this, this picture is, would have been nice, but the fact that um, you know, most, of it, most of it's washed out. So uh, you know, when you get these kind of landscapes, once you, if you just turn around a little bit, make sure that the, uh, the, the sunlight is, is coming from somewhere around um, your shoulder or towards the side or, or indeed from behind you even better. And of course that does mean you have to consider which direction you're flying because if you're flying um, west to east, um, your pictures are going to be better in the morning. It'll pick up the colours, blues of water, that kind of thing. If you're flying east to west, um, well that, your pictures are going to be better in the afternoon. And so sometimes it's best if you see something really nice um, you'll fly over and then turn around and take it and, and just okay risk the chance that you might be losing a bit of height to take the picture and I, I tend to do that. The other thing I've been, I've been thinking about a lot over the last couple of years, maybe more, is colours of gliders. Um, I've realised there are certain colours of gliders that actually pop out much better in particular types of landscape or particular times of year. Red is a really good example. They, um, it pops out very good, um, particularly when you've got snowy landscapes. Um, and sometimes uh, even white gliders will, will look quite nice if you've got, um, you know, kind of a nice frosty landscape, but you're still seeing, um, you know, the colours of the fields. And I particularly like the, the blues and the purples. Of, I, I think this is a rush. I think this is, uh, this is a Ken Leith. And I have noticed that they do tend to, uh, they do tend to pop out in the um, in the heather covered uh, mountain slopes uh, with a bit of with a grey granite and some nice you know grass. Um, they just yeah the, the colours I think are just you know they they really emphasise the, the joy of paragliding I think sometimes. The other thing is I sparingly use um, uh, use my zoom, um, but, um, and I tend to wait for something that's obviously um in the in the far distance and then i use the zoom to 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 compress the distance um to make the the photo look much more interesting but the other thing but, but the one thing i have to remember to do is in a nice sunny day which i've got i've got my camera on p program mode and i've got it on 100 the iso of 100 i will shift that up to an iso of 200 so that it can then use um, a faster shutter speed because obviously the zoom requires a bit more light and therefore if you don't do that you tend to you tend to get a blurred image and again here which is the the last one was um, was uh, Tinto by the way Tinto South and here I was actually approaching the top of Ben Nevis I think you just make out the tiny tiny little dots in the snow there which are actually people and again I used the zoom here to um, 
to really just the compress um, so that you get a nice picture of the of the locks, Lock Island, Lock, Lock Linney in the background. I think I, I was flying from Ben Toic here and I happened to go over Ben Nevis, so it was a, it was a glorious flight. Uh, the other thing that I really like um, is dusk or the end of the, the end of the day, particularly in in um, in early spring and late autumn, because you get those really nice kind of hues to the sky. You get a kind of reddish tint. Again, you often have to pick the, the color of glider that uh, um, that would look best. Um, but uh, Generally, that's some, that's some of our best pictures have been, been taken just when the light is starting to tail off. Uh, and sometimes you can really get glorious um, skies. You know, for example, here, this is Bishop. And the glider and the landscape actually looks as if it's monochrome. It looks as if it's black and white. Um, and, and, you know, the sky is giving the color. In fact, it, it wasn't. It, it, um, because it was a very, very frosty day, um, the land just, uh, just lost its color. Really, and the glider I think was probably a um, a brown glider, but it sort of in the light it sort of came out as monochrome as well. In in certain countries, and this is India, um, with a lot of um, dust in the sky and perhaps even with um, pollution around and so on, you can get glorious sunsets, but even way 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 before sunset, um, and. Uh, you know, sometime in, in India, I got quite a lot of these, um, you know, maybe an hour before the sun actually met, actually went down. And also, um, even before the sun's gone down, if you can position yourself um, at a particular time of day, you get these great sort of shafts of radiance that, um, that, that get thrown off of some of the mountaintops. But it does mean that you have to kind of cruise around for a bit and again, lose a bit of height if you're, if you're, if you want to get a photo of these things, but sometimes I think it's worth it. And then who doesn't like a nice fly down um, in the ultimate hill end? Um, you know, sometimes the, the landscape is, you know, it's just amazing. You know, it's a, it's not the best, it's not the most uh, exciting of, uh, of locations, but, you know, sometimes, um, you know, a good sunset will make it make all the difference. And I don't know why I like this photo, but I just do. Um, again, low light, everything's starting to go red. Um, you've got a lone glider who's just disappearing off. Um, this is uh, this is the last sort of flight flying time um, on Ben Leddy uh, on one evening, and uh, you know just caught the light right, I think. And uh, and fortunately, there was a paraglider who was disappearing off. Um, it looks like they're going through that valley. I don't think they're actually that far, but it, you know, it just, for me, um, it really made the photo. The other thing that I've been doing quite, quite a lot lately is that previously I've been, you know, looking forward or, or you know, looking around and taking pictures essentially just in front of me or to the side. And I often forget to just look straight down. Um, because sometimes you can get some really, really nice photos just simply just by holding a camera um, and just taking a picture directly down below you. So this is a this is an okay picture. This is um, this is on sky, quite nice. But I found I thought that maybe the, the better picture once the glider was going underneath me, um, you know, with the nice blue water, um, it just added something which uh, which the previous photo didn't have. And sometimes when you're taking pictures, particularly when you've got gliders below you, sometimes the, the landscape, like this kind of you know, marbled effect, really actually makes the photo. Without that, um, this photo would have been a fairly bog standard picture of a paraglider. And of course, in autumn, you start to get a lot of different colors, um, which, uh, you know, which really uh, makes for interesting photos. And uh, you know, sometimes I'll just simply just take a picture of that. Well, sometimes I just take a picture of a road because, uh, you know, it, sometimes these pictures are just, just have their own sort of fascination and their own interest. Um, and uh, again, um, probably 
again, probably in autumn. And this is the previous one, I think, was uh, was uh, St. Mary's Lock. And this one is it's just coming to land in Ben Ledi. I mean, it literally was just as I was thinking about landing, I thought, well, I'll just I'm going over water, which is might seem to be a constant theme in some of my pictures. Um, and, uh, you know, the picture just presented itself. and I literally just pulled the camera out and um, just took a picture straight down. And, uh, you know, sometimes when the light um, is caught on the water, you get these, these, get these great effects, particularly in places like Rannoch Moor here. Um, um, I think this is probably an early evening, but the sun's still quite strong. And you've got these, you know, you've got these really nice sort of veined effects, bright um, flowing um, molten metal or, or whatever you'd like to see in these, these things. But, you know, sometimes these things just stand out. Or you just get to see some, you know, some of the local um, uh, features. So this is Coral Bridge. I think I'd flown from Glencoe here, um, and I was, you know, I was looking for, I was looking to to land. But as I was looking around, I noticed that Coral Bridge and the Falls of Laura, the flow of water that goes through there, which I, I have actually dived. It's 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 quite a sled ride. Um, I think it's I think some of the fast, fastest flowing water in Europe. I think. Um, and you can see there's a standing wave there, so uh, it was just one of those pictures that had to be taken at the time. And then sometimes you get the wacky. Um, this is flying over, uh, uh, I think, Loch Rannoch. Um, and I just noticed this little island, this, this little keep. Um, and the water was so blue, um, it's, it, it seemed to be demanding that a picture was taken as I flew over. Sometimes I um, I just take pictures just to remind us uh, some of the stupid decisions I've made. Um, this is in Australia, um, where I'd flown off of uh, a, a little hill um, in a little village or a little town called Manila, which is actually very famous for long distance flying. And I'd made um, quite a few stupid decisions as to where I would go. And so I ended up somewhere in the outback. And uh, this, was, this was my landing spot. Um, I think afterwards there was about a 15 or 20 mile walk to um, to um, a small farm and then I managed to um, persuade them to drive me another 20 miles to a road only to be told that it was Easter Monday was Easter Sunday and there was probably only one car coming during the day anyway the end of that was that I noticed that somebody else had made a, um, a bad decision there was one other paraglider actually on that road um, he was an Australian and uh, he had um, he had somebody coming to get him. Happy days. And then you, you see sometimes the downright strange. So this is, uh, I think, this is actually some kind of terraced farming um, on a hill, hillside in India. And then just some, you know, really nice, you know, sea shots. I'm sure mo a lot of you will, will recognize this as Olu Um I'm sure the pictures like these, um, you know, fairly common because it's so easy to take as you're coming down off of uh, off of the, the mountainside. Same again here. And I did take a little flight uh, um, a little way away along the coast to Butterfly Valley um, before I landed inside the valley and then had to take a little water taxi or a boat back to Oliganis. I took this photo straight down again. Um, you know, sometimes you get some scenery, which you're probably never going to see again. So um, this is the three pagodas of the, of the Chongsheng Temple in, uh, in the Yunnan province of China. It's just on the edge of the Tibetan Plateau. And we were actually flying off the Tibetan Plateau. We did actually have to employ some um, fairly radical decisions in terms of what transport took us up the mountainside. Um, and that was, uh, that was a four hour journey on, on a horse to get up to um, take off. But when you took off and headed off over the valley, you got to see some you know, fairly spectacular um, temple scenery. So this is the Chongshen Monastery. Um, at one point I did entertain thought, perhaps even trying to land in there. Um, but eventually I, I landed in the greenery to one side, um, thinking I'd probably scare the hell out of some people. In fact, when you're doing that, of course you do have to, um, you do have to, uh, you know, consider local sensitivities. Um, obviously, flying and having a camera in some countries um, might be inviting unwanted attention. So you, uh, it's good to have a bit of a smile on your face when you're landing. 
A lot of people ask me, um, you know, do I manipulate my images? Uh, yes, I do. And one of the primary manipulations is cropping. Um, the, image, the images that come out of the camera at maximum resolution uh, are a three to two ratio, uh, which is, a, you know, it's a fairly old fashioned sort of picture ratio. And I don't see, it's artificial. I don't see any reason why pictures shouldn't be various different shapes. And I tend to manipulate them to, to tell a story. So in this case, um, it seemed obvious to me that, uh, you know, this kind of shape of picture works well with the fact that you're showing a paraglide, you're showing the beach, and of course, a very big feature here, which is the um, Bass Rock. And, and here, uh, along the Gargunic Ridge, I actually waited for about 10 or 15 minutes for, for a parrot. I'd already picked this particular location. I'd already decided what shape photo. And that's the thing is I don't sometimes take photos. I know that I'm going to crop them. I've already decided on what shape they're going to be. And so I kind of waited um, for, I think this is Fred here coming along um, because I wanted the water and I wanted the, I wanted the, uh, um, the wind turbines in, in the picture. So I, I actually waited here as I say, for quite some time for somebody to come past. And then you get, you know, sometimes these great days where, you know, the north of sky, where you've got four gliders just sort of passing in front of you. And the fact that the gliders are really, you know, almost vanishingly small just adds to them, you know, the, the spectacular scenery, basically. And the same kind of thing here. I often do take pictures where the glider is actually just a small speck or you know a small part of the scenery it just really makes the scenery pop out and really just explains why why we do it i suppose um that's actually the same location but um just a different time of the year and uh and again this is another one of my favorite photos just because of the way the light is and the little smattering snow just makes it um you know almost almost dreamlike um, and, and really makes the photo. And then sometimes you just get a great evening and you get a little sparkle of, uh, of light. I've broken all my rules here because I'm taking right, taking my photo right into the light. I haven't adjusted the, uh, the exposure, but hell, you know, it, in this case, it, it was part of the photo. And again, um, you know, adjusted, made it a, you know, very wide just to give the majesty of the, of, of the snowy landscape here. Um, and of course here on sky, um, again, overexposed sky, I don't really care. In fact, there's, there's two tiny gliders um, sort of just off from the middle there, um, which I think, you know, kind of makes it that, and also there's that nice shadow that comes down it's that time of day. Um, but again, I stretched the image um, to make it to my mind, um, to make it look at, at that much more spectacular. But just to show I can go the other way, here I've actually, you know, squeezed in, made it, made the image a bit, bit squarer, just because I felt that's what was needed. And then one of my kind of more favourite uh, images, I suppose, um, is uh, is Glencoe, and I think that's uh, that's Tim Jackson just down there. Um, now I'm observing the rural thirds, even when I'm, you know, even when I um, crop the image to make it uh, sort of widescreen. Um, I just, I love this image. And again, I, I waited, I, I lost quite a lot of height, I think, just waiting for Tim to wait, make his way along the ridge to the right, right place. Um, and I wanted the sea in the picture and I wanted the, obviously wanted the mountains with the snow, but I really, really wanted a small paraglider. And it's just lucky that he's a nice bright blue paraglider as well. I have been experimenting. Um, so I did wonder, well, is it worth thinking about black and white photography? Uh, and I, for, for a number of years, I've never even tried it, but uh, eventually I kind of thought, well, it, it might be worth it. Um, so I, as the, cam the camera is, you can switch it onto black and white. Um, and I've done that, or you can, you can actually go into Photoshop and you can turn your images into black and white if that's what you want, but I never really get the same results. And I, um, and with a lot of these pictures, I employ the same strategy as I did when I used when I was using film. Um, is that I I put a, a red filter on, which actually makes the sky darker. Um, 
And you know, here is a good example. Um, it's not the sky, um, but it's that um, water that sh that's bright blue when you've got the right light on Rannoch Moor. Um, and that turns black, which I, I think you know, makes quite a good image. And you've got quite a, a, quite a light glider there as well. So it's, it's coming out well against the, the landscape. And then some uh, pictures of, uh, possibly, I think this might be Broughton, um, you know, a nice, interesting sky. And then, um, and then, you know, another one, I think this might actually be Hill End again, was uh, another one of those kind of really interesting evenings with lots of shafts of, of, of light uh, as the sunset starts to get set up. And then the other experimental area I've, been, I, I, I've tried is this. It's something called a Lomo spinner. It's a film camera, incredibly simple. Um, it's got a, a clockwork um, a pull, ring pull. You pull it, um, it loads the spring, you let go, and the camera spins around 360 degrees or more and takes a picture. It just pulls the film through the camera and takes a picture on you know, a large part of the film. Rather than one exposure, it, it uses about eight um, normal exposures on the film. Still by film, so you know it's worth a go. Um, made by a company that um, bought up um, an old Eastern European camera company because they they were artists and they liked the way that these cheap cameras um, rendered certain types of colours with a very very cheap plastic lenses, and now they've become a bit of a sensation. But anyway, they 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 start they started to make this still employing the cheap plastic lenses, but I thought this would be interesting to take in the air. And here's some of the results. So the top is Aberfoyle, and the bottom one is Hill End. Um, you might just be able to make out the one in Aberfoyle, it's spun just slightly greater than 360 degrees. So the, the water at either end there is the same thing. Um, and also, you know, the color rendering is, is you know, it's quite, um, quite artificial looking. And that's really just simply because of the characteristics of the lens more than anything else. And of course, I'm using film. Um, the one thing I probably forgot to mention is that, you know, as a film photographer, in terms of balancing colours and things like that, we were always used to selecting film with certain different colour hues. So essentially, our images were colour manipulated already um, uh, before we even had them printed. Um, anyway, you can see that also it prints all the way over the sprockets, which I think is a, you know, is a great effect. Um, it was experimental. Um, and I've actually tried it the other way around as well. And you end up with, well, Tadpole Man. Um, but, you know, great fun to use. And then finally, some gratuitous, gratuitous mooning. I've been trying to get gliders and, and the moon in for some time, but you guys never seem to cooperate. Um, uh, this is probably one of the best I've managed to date. Um, and this is the other one. And that's the end. Right. Graham, that was um, fantastic. Um, I'm just trying to, uh, to sort of, uh, pull things together here. Um, no, that was really good. And particularly to see, you know, all the application and how to, how all the shots have taken place, <coughs> especially in a lot of the areas that we all know, um, in Scotland. Are there any, any questions for uh, Graham, in terms of you can either stick your mitt up or um, uh, hi Graham, right uh, cheers for that, Adrian. Um, nice to see your photos again. <laughs> um, as I see, do you ever have a do you, do you use that image or have an image stabilizer in your camera? Yeah, it, as you'll appreciate, it's it's a fairly old camera now, um, and I did say right at the beginning there that I, um, that lasted until 
last year, but I've actually managed to get another one. Great thing is with digital cameras, when they're old, you can get them quite cheap. So it, has fairly, it, it does have image stabilization um, built into it, but it's fairly rudimentary and it kicks in um, when it wants to, when it thinks that it, it's needed. Um, but uh, I, I have to say that, um, you know, it to, what happens is that you get this little hand that comes up on the screen when it's trying to image stabilize. And I very rarely see that when I'm flying. You know, with the ASA set either 100 or 200, I don't seem to have that problem. Don't need it. Yeah, I think I just, yeah, I think normally it's fine. I think just on days where it's, because I think with the lens that I tend to use the most, it doesn't have any image stabilization. And then, yeah, it's just kind of low light days. Can I used to be really just very careful and kind of take using a steady hand. So how, how old your camera is, but I would I would just probably do what I do, which is put it on P mode and mm. boost the sensitivity by by boosting the ISO, and then you won't have that problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah good tip. Yeah. Graham, if you if you if you go into scene mode because you can't be bothered with all the adjustments, what sort of scene would you go? Should it be sport? Should it be aerial? Should it be landscape? Uh, I would probably I don't use it really again because because uh, they are they're rather artificial and the camera is actually trying to manipulate the image for you. It's kind of trying to assume. Um, you know, what would be a nice thing to be a particular, you know, that particular scene. So it might change the color balance. Um, it might try and change the way it focuses. So uh, if you had to use scene mode, then I'll put it on landscape. Um, it depends. A lot of ca cameras have different types of scene modes. They do different, slightly different things. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say landscape. I mean, uh, as, a, as you can see, I'm a great advocate advocate of the P mode, the program mode, um, because um, that particular camera, at least, and no others do as well, they make quite good decisions. But when you say it's program mode, presumably you have to check, what, what are you do, setting, the aperture or the...? No, uh, the program mode sets all of those things. Really, essentially what the program mode is... Just is automatic. It just, it just, it, it doesn't choose the ISO mm. in my camera anyway. It allows you to choose the ISO yourself. Um, you know, and, and what happens is that if it's particularly dark or, uh, or approaching towards dark, it will try and set uh, you know, quite a fast ISO, which will introduce noise into the picture. Um, you know, it, it thinks you're probably going to be quite happy with that because if you're just snapping some stuff, you won't really notice it. But if you're like me, if you're taking pictures because you want to crop it, that means you're going to magnify it slightly, and then that noise starts to come out. And um, I mean, obviously, one of the, the challenges sometimes is when it's a bit lumpy, bumpy. You don't want to let go of the, the controls. Yeah. Well, again, that's one of the reasons why I selected the camera that allows me to operate one-handed, and I, I did get quite kind of quite adept at being able to fly the get glider holding. The two brakes. As long as the brakes are slight, slightly looser than the one I've got, I've noticed that when I clutch the brakes of my current mentor, they're too tight and I need to loosen them off a bit because that tends to make the glider sort of slew from side to side. My previous one, though, I was, it was quite easy. Um, but there are occasions of late, in fact, where the, 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 the flying has been particularly active and I've taken less photos because it, obviously it's not worth the risk then. But you know, that. There are other options, of course. You can mount your camera, um, you know, on something. I just found that having it around my neck and, and just lifting it and taking a picture, and it doesn't take, with program mode, it doesn't take very long at all. Just that half the press, make sure that it's focused and bang, it's gone. Um, but there, you can, you can act, there, are, there are other options where you can mount the camera and actually um, have it on a timer. So when you press the shutter release, um, you just have to tap it once and then it, it will take the picture shortly after that, so two seconds or something like that. But, you know, there's a number of things, but um, I found the way that I, you know, the way that I use the camera has been, you know, served me reasonably well, but there are definitely times and there have been def definitely been flights where I've used the camera very little just because I'm just too afraid to let go of uh, 
let go of the brakes. Do you, do you tend to do much post-processing? Are you generally taking JPEGs? I, yeah, I mean, because I come from the, you know, in the, in the photography that I do for my work, I, I use ex exclusively RAW. And, um, you know, so I'm quite used to going into um, Photoshop and, and, you know, rebalancing light levels and things like that. Um, and apart from the cropping, I do sometimes, you know, I do sometimes slightly manip manipulate the color to the way I remember it, because cameras, the thing is that, um, you know, cameras are making decisions about color in the same way that your, you know, each individual eye does as well. I mean, nothing is absolutely co completely correct. Um, and on quite a few occasions, I've actually um, reduced the uh, vibrancy of colors because I think it just didn't look too, just didn't look real. Um, you know, so sometimes, I, you know, I will do that. Sometimes not. Sometimes, the, you know, as it comes out of the camera, it's fine. Um, you know, as I say, the major manipulation for me is really cropping. But while you're doing that, you might as well have a look at the color. You might, have, might as well have a look at the, how the light balances between the, 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 the landscape and the sky. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have any qualms about that. Do you ever sell any of your pictures, Will? Um, how learning pictures? Yeah, I have sold one or two, but mainly because they've been showing, you know, a particular landscape but um obviously a lot of my pictures are part and parcel of my work for the um for the diving work and they do get that part of my payment as it were and um and actually usually part of my contract is that uh, we do we're doing scientific work and part of that contract is to spend at least one day um getting high quality pictures of uh, of, of the location um for people like Scottish Natural Heritage and so on, so that they can put them on their publicity or, or, or um, you know, Marine Scotland. Uh, my, yeah, my photos are peppered all over the web. I, you know, I never get, I never get to know where they go because uh, I just hand them, hand them over to, you know, those organisations. But I have actually been asked by Marine Scotland on occasion whether I could get some aerial, uh, aerial photos. Um, never really been you know they don't seem to understand that with a paraglider you don't really have a lot of control over where you're going to be going have you got them all up on instagram or something Graham, or, a, or a selection of subset of your huge collection uh i haven't uh i'm not actually on instagram but i do have a selection on, on google photos i mean if you yeah i think if, probably if you look at my name they're probably all publicly viewable um and i probably should start i've got probably tens of thousands of pictures, um, you know, and obviously that's one of the hardest things is when you, you're, you're, you're up in the sky, you've maybe gone for two days of paragliding, you come back with a whole pile of pictures and you're exhausted. And, um, you know, that there's, there is a process that, I um, mean, and you have to be quite disciplined where you kind of sit down and um, things like um, a, a Photoshop, you know, some kind of photo sorting system is actually really, really useful, where you can just go through them, mark them for going back and, and kind of reprocessing them. Um, but I, yeah, I, I, sh I probably should sort of, I, I, did, I did toy with Flickr for a while, um, you know, because you can put better quality photos up there. But of course, they've started to, you know, charge for, for that. But Instagram probably, yeah, it's a good idea. Um, but as I say, if you want to see more, you can see selections of both paragliding and underwater photos on Google Photos. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed, Graham. Uh, it's been great and uh, very informative, hopefully, for everyone. And really nice to see lots of shots, especially as from Friday, we can all get out there to different places. It's cool. Mike, it's Gordon. Can I just ask Graham what he thinks about drones? <laughs> uh, what, in terms of photography? Yeah, you use. Do you use them? Yeah, um, I do. Um, I don't personally have a drone, but uh, certainly for the work that uh, I've been doing both here and overseas, drones are becoming um, very, very common. Um, if nothing else, because you can get a really, really high quality, you know, 4K video, which you can actually take quite, quite good images, still images off of as well. And obviously a lot of these cameras will take still images and video at the same time. Um, yeah, I mean, you can get you can get great pictures with them. 
don't really seem to have much of a soul in the pictures though because i mean you i don't know what it is but um but I, I suppose with drones we're, we're using them for work anyway so we're actually we have a particular task of being done but no i can see that's going to be coming you know that that's going to be a favored way of taking spectacular photos in, uh, in quite difficult environments for, um, in the coming years. Yeah. Good. Anything else? Any other questions from anyone? Right. Graham, thank you very much indeed. Look forward to. Um, there were no shots of me in the, any of your photos. Uh, you remember I mentioned about uh, the colours of, uh, of certain types of gliders, um, you know, popping out. Scrotty, scrotty orange doesn't pop out. Mm, okay, I'll have to get a red one then. <laughs> cool. Thanks very much, Graham. Right, part two this evening, we're handing over to Alistair. And mm. again, I'm sure everyone knows Alistair has been flying since 1998. He's been a club coach for 16 years and is a rare element in Scotland, a BHPA licensed reserve repacker. He's also club secretary of SMPC and has been a member of LLSC since the early 2000s. Are you not chairman at the moment or something? I can't remember. No, I no. think I'd remember that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, he says he's a distinctly average pilot, although I'm sure there are others that would disagree with that, but still working on becoming truly competent, as we all are. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Alistair to talk about height mising. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, what I'm supposed to do is go around to screen sharing, which I need to do. Um, and I will do so as soon as I master the technology. Bear with me. Okay. Um, why I'm talking about height, height I'm mising. Second, I can, yep. Hang on a second. I don't think it's appeared for us yet. Okay. Um, I'm not screen sharing as yet. All right. So that's, that's the plan of just making sure I, I had it. Technology not being one of my 40s, as probably everyone knows. So we shall stick with just me chatting initially. And uh, when I get to the presentation bit, so I'll probably have to enlist, enlist Mike's help to get it working. Okay, why do you want to be a height miser? Well, height's kind of important to us because that's what you need to fly because we always lose it when we're gliding. And what's the main advantage? Well, basically, you do more flying. Um, if you're soaring, you can see what's going on. Height gives you time and options as to what you can do. And if you're thermaling, then again, it gives you even more height and time to work out what you're going to do and be the best person and placed to do it. Main advantage in thermic days is if you're higher than everyone else by using good techniques to or the height you've managed to acquire, is that it gives you freedom to actually go and use thermals. If you're in with the, the main crowd down below, you're going to be constrained by the fact there'll be 10 other pilots possibly trying to use the same thermal lowdown trapped in against the hill, and life becomes much more complicated because instead of just concentrating on the thermal, you're busy dodging hills, other pilots, and rarely will you be able to fly exactly the way you want to. So, for a thermic day, the ideal is to use normal soaring climbing skills as best you can to get all the height you can, primarily because the usual scenario is, as a thermal arrives, it's pulling the air in from all around as it comes. So as it's approaching the hill, the, wheel, the met wind is actually on the hill will decrease. So if you're only at hill height at that point, you're either going to have to slope land or you'll go down neither of which are terribly conducive to using the thermal when it's arrived. So if it's all possible, what you want to be doing is have enough height so that you can ride out the um, reduced met wind until the thermal arrives, and then you can use it and look down at those who are either slope landing or sweating their way back up the hill. So, so far, I hope, um, fairly obvious, 
if you wait till you've slope landed, then you're faced usually with taking off into a, a thermal actually on the hill, which unless your takeoff technique is spot on is fairly intimidating. So it's much easier to use it if you've stayed in the air and are able to climb out. So assuming everyone agrees with that or was at least willing to be convinced, let's have a look at how you might get that height and more importantly, keep it once you've got it. How, in other words, do you become the Ebenezer Scrooge of height? Obviously, the first thing to see is that it's not going to be relevant on days when there's strong lift, you know, the wind's right on the hill, there's plenty of lift and you're cruising around 304 feet above the hill. It's not important because you can top up your lift anytime you like. Um, the important time is when the conditions are marginal, you're barely maintaining, you don't want to go down and it's harder to climb out. So that's when the finesse of your skills in hanging on to the height that you've got already or whatever there is already, it comes into play. And that's really the bits we're going to be looking at. Okay, conditions that you might have. If it's good soaring, as I say, it's not a problem. If on your main beat across the hill, at the main height that you're at, you cannot maintain your height, then you will go down because you're going to lose height in your turns. And as you lose height, you get further down the hill, you'll drop out of the, the good lift if it's that marginal and you will be going down. So being a height miser there is to recognize that's happening. Do not go on another five or six beats saying, oh, I might pick it up and there might be something coming up that's better, assuming it's not a thermic day, because the chances are it won't. On pure soaring, it will not get better as you go further down. So the height miser's decision in that case is to slope land, top land or slope land, and that way you are hanging on to the height you've got, which is a height miser. That's you know, not terribly exciting. It's just a slope landing as long as you know how to do it. So have it in your bag of tricks to do. If you're in the marginal day, and the marginal day for me is when you're on your beat along the hill, and cunningly, we have our high-tech audiovisual aids, which I'll bring up to you. <sighs> the black line is the hill, looking at it from above. The green is your lift band. And the red arrow is the wind direction. So, so far so good. When you're on this bit, if you're just going along there and you're just getting enough to maintain your height, that's when it's really going to be marginal. That's as good as it's going to get because your wind is coming up to the hill, you're in the lift band, it's all even, there's no variations in, in what's going on. So that is to and fro, you will maintain your height. And the problem arises, of course, at the turns, because when you turn, you're going to lose height. We'll look at why that is in a bit more detail. There may be alterations to this. If you have areas here where the hill isn't changed, but down below the ground is steeper or flatter, then you may get changes in the amount of lift that you're actually experiencing as you go along. If you do that, make the most of them, stay in them. How do you do stay in them? You know, slow down. You do not want to bat through them like a bat out of hell because all the time you're in lifting air, you get an improvement. So slow down. Obviously not to the stall point, but as much as you can by applying brakes, that will increase the lift slightly, but not to the point where you're getting huge drag on it and make the most of what you've got. If you're slowing down in the lifty bits, making sure you're in the best bit of lift, and one of the things you have to be wary of in the hill is sometimes very close to the hill, the temptation when it's light is to hug the hill as close as possible. It's not always the best idea because what you can find is that there is friction, friction by the air passing over the grass, heather, whatever is on the hillside, and that itself slows the air down closest to the hill. If you go out 20, 50 feet from the hill, you may find that that has been smoothed out and you actually get a better lift band separated out from the hill. You won't know unless you explore, but it's certainly worth a try that if you're really struggling close in, you can find, um, depending on the hillside surface, that you get a better lift band further out. So definitely worth an explore. Definitely worth looking at. If the wind direction is not absolutely smack on the hill, that's obviously the crucial factor. There, straight on the hill, you're going to get lift. When you get to here, 
I'll get my pointer out, make life easier. When you get here, the air is going to slip off that way. You're not going to get the same lift, which is why the lift band disappears or at least will dwindle down. On the other hand, if the wind switches around so that it's now facing into the air, that will be liftier than this long straight bit. So that's the bit where you want to concentrate your turning. I know this is all bog standard stuff. All of you know this, but it helps just to put it in context and remind everybody of, of what you're doing. So if you want to hang on and use the lifty bits, that's fine. Um, uh, there are other ways you could think about slowing down and whether that's worthwhile is possibly a trade-off. You might want to think about it. Um, particularly as if people are nowadays are using pod harnesses. Pod harnesses are great, but you have to remember what their background is. It's from guys who are racing in comps who want to get places as fast as possible. You'll no doubt remember from all those little diagrams in your club pilot exam or pilot exam even, that there's the two kinds of drag. There's the induced drag from flying and the form drag just from the shape you have. And the form drag is the one that increases exponentially as you get faster. So for the guys who want to go places really fast, and the fact that the drag increases exponentially as you get faster, reducing the amount of drag you've got by using a prod harness properly set up is clearly hugely important. I get that, and that's fine. I don't have any problem with it. Improves your glide angle, improves your speed as well, to a lesser degree. All good. But then that's not really what we're doing here, is it? What we're doing here is looking at where we are here and trying to maintain height. If you're just maintaining height on a cross-country flight, you're in survival mode. You don't want to lose it. It's not good enough to climb out in. So you do not want to lose what you've got. So slow down. So is it possibly worthwhile to make yourself less aerodynamically efficient by not using your pot harness in the sleek, pointed out, tiny front area way, but in fact, increasing it, drop your feet down, sit more up like, like a cyclist or motorbike rider coming up to a corner to use the air to slow you down a bit. You're not using your brakes to get dragged that way, but it's a different kind of drag that to some extent will slow you down. And the longer you can spend in lifting air could be a good thing. I suppose you'd have to balance up the fact that if you do that, then the extra drag will affect your lift drag coefficient as you're flying along. And you have to, I suppose, if you had the, the knowledge of everything, you'd have to work out, is the extra time I'm spending in this lifting air worth the decrease in um, glide angle that I'm getting because I've got more drag? Where, where does the balance lie? I don't know. It's going to be personal to you and your kit. And the only way to try it is to try it out. So all these things that I'll be discussing are things that might work for you, might not work for somebody else, but everyone's individual. And the thing is to at least be aware of these things and try them out, which is really the theme of this evening. Let's look at things that maybe you haven't considered that maybe you should consider. So slowing down and lift, certainly in thermaling, that's what you do. You find a bit of lift, you slow down and you turn it and you do anything to create your glide angle, crank the wing right over because it's in lift. This is a much higher, sorry, much lower degree of lift that we're dealing with, but the principle is the same. You want to stay in lift. So you want to stay in the lift and slowing down in the good bits is good. If you're doing these things, you are maximizing your lift on the straight parts of the flight. I don't have to tell you much more about that. That's just self-evident. So the major problem then is realistically on turns. And the reason for that is, I hope, fairly self-evident. Your paraglider is basically a curved over shape. So you've got lift that goes straight up and bits that go out the side. If you turn it, you're turning the wing over. So well, some of the lift still goes up, but the more of it goes off to the side, therefore your sink rate is going to increase, it's going to go down faster. And then that leads to the question, okay, simple CD number one, which you'll hear talked about quite a lot is let's have an efficient turn. And what people generally mean by an efficient turn is a turn that moves you as little as possible from being 
in the normal flying position. In other words, as little banked over as you can get away with. So you apply a brake and what you get is a wide and slow turn. And the, the theory behind it is that if you do this, you will minimize the extra sink you get because you're turning, because you've kept the thing as upright as possible. And as a theory goes, that's, yeah, I can see, I can see the absolute sense in that, it would be fine. But I think it has to be done in recognition that what the conditions are. I think the conditions when that works are if you have large areas of even lift all over the place. And if you've got that, then clearly, if you're in the same kind of lift without sinky bits or extra high lifty bits, and it's all over the place, then a long, wide, slow turn in it keeps you in that with as little effect on your sink read as you can get away with. So good, that's, that's quite good. So a lot of people say, that's the best kind of turn to do. And I say, yes, but it depends on the conditions. So for example, if we just take, this is an example, if you've got your paraglider trundling along here, and you get to here and say, oh, we'll do a big wide turn, your lift takes you like this. And the problem with that, I hope is fairly evident, there your lift band, you come out of it and you're turning out of it. And because you've turned out of it and have to come back to it, your turn actually has to be not a 180, but it has to be a 270 to get you back to the lift band. Now, if all of this is in lift, then you'll get your desired effect. If it's not, then you're not going to get lift all the way around. So the longer you spend in the air that's not lifting is not a good thing. So, okay, if that's the situation, what's the alternative? The answer is, well, how about doing uh, a tight turn? Um, downside with the turn, obviously, is that your sink rate will go up. You've tilted the wing over much more. More of the lift is perpendicular to the wing overall, which means it's out to the side, and therefore your sink rate will increase even further. But if you can do a tight turn, so tight that you can stay in the lift band for longer, then you're going to get a better effect overall because you've done your turn in lifting air, which is it always turn and lift. It applies in thermaling, but it equally applies to turns on the hill, I would say. So if you do numbers on it, um, it's hard to know which is going to be comparatively better. For example, if you've got a if your turn on a slow glide will take you to two meters a second down, it's probably reasonable. One meter a second is general flight, is how you lose flight. You always lose height at about a meter a second when gliding anyway, whatever you do. So if you put in a gentle turn, that might go up to two meters a second. If it takes you 20 seconds to do your half turn to get back into it, then you'll lose, let me think, 40 meters. Okay, okay. But then if you go to a tighter turn where you're losing it to three meters per second, but you turn in 13 seconds, then it's 39 seconds, 39 meters of the two. In that example, it works out. There will be others when it doesn't work out like that. But the main thing I think is both of those go on the assumption, which is I think a rather rash one, that your rate of sync will be consistent throughout your turn. And particularly with a big wide turn, when you're soaring in a lift band, which is probably small because it's marginal conditions, is probably not going to be as good for you as a tighter turn. That's my guess. Um, could be wrong. You know, there may be enough lift out there to enable you to turn your big slow turn. You know, maybe it works better. Don't know. But the question is, you'll have to work out for yourself how you turn, but far more importantly, where you turn. This example again, the hill goes away here, the airflow is then going to go along that way. If we're coming to the end of the hill together, you'll get sideways venturi effect as well, so you won't get lift here. So clearly, if you want to do your turning in lift, you want to turn here so that this first part of your turn keeps you in the lift band as much as you can. And the first thing to remember, and I'll probably repeat it more than once in this, is what you should be doing is not relying on your video. 
because there's always a lag in a video. He's giving you a nice beep, beep, beep. By the time you realize there's a beep missing, you've passed the point at which the lift is still there. And if you're only starting your turn then, you're covering probably eight or nine meters a second out the way. So you're already past the base of the lift when you want to be turning in lift. So you really don't want to align just on your radius to 12 to do it. You need to anticipate that the end of the route is coming up or there's a change or from your previous beats, you know, there's a problem. But don't rely entirely on uh, your video because the lag means that you're not going to get the most updated information as the best place to turn. Um, we're dealing in marginal conditions. What I also think you should do is increase the sensitivity you have to what your wing is telling you. Um, if you have the standard toilet chain grip, showing my age and the kind of toilets I had in my youth, then you're gripping it with your fist. You don't have much sensitivity as to what's happening, what the wing is telling you through the brake lines. So if you don't do it already, strongly urge anyone to adopt a kind of grip where you've got at least one finger resting gently on the brake line as it goes up, because that is far more sensitive to increases or decreases in pressure in the line. So you'll know more about what the wing's telling you that are we coming to a bit of lighter lift or stronger lift because it feels tighter or looser in your hand. So it is important that you maximize the information you're getting from your wing because it's telling you or trying to tell you what's going on. If you're not listening, that's your fault. It's not the wing's fault. Some wings are more talkative than others, absolutely. But you can at least do your best to fine tune your reception so that you can listen into what's happening and get a good idea as to what the wing's trying to tell you. There's a variation on the efficient turn, which is interesting to, to talk about. There are some people who maintain that the best turn is done both in thermaling and in other terms by um, brake on the side that you want to turn towards and applying opposite brake shift, which sounds rather odd, it's contrary to what we would normally do. But if you're a devotee of the efficient turning thing, the argument for it is that you're applying a mountain brake to turn your right and you're countering that, not with outside brake, which is more drag and counter to the way you want to turn, but with weight shift effect, which does try to take you the other way. So you're playing the two turning impetuses of the brake and the weight shift against each other. So it's opposite way brake shift. It sounds weird to me. I have tried it a couple of times and it just, it just generally does feel odd. On the other hand, one of the people who teaches it is a gentleman called Patrick Berraud in France who teaches it in his school. And as he won the Paragliding World Cup in 2001, I would guess he knows something about flying quite well, probably better than I do. So if he's one who thinks it, then he must think there's something in it, possibly in the conditions he gets, i.e. larger, smoother areas of lift than we tend to get when it's marginally breezy, then that may be a valid technique. Um, don't know for sure. Um, experiment with it if you like, but um, it feels particularly weird to me, but then that's because I don't fly that way normally. There are those who recommend that if you're um, bridge soaring, that there is as a safety measure, uh, uh, I'm suggesting that you should do just that, which is you weight shift away from the ridge and have a slight break input to keep the thing level. The thinking being that should you get a collapse, you're already weight shifting away from the hill because the collapse on the side nearest the hill will take you into the hill, whereas if you're already weight shifting against it, you have a better chance of maintaining um, at least an even course or at least not having a hard turn in towards the hill. Um, I can understand that. I suppose if you fly like that a lot, then it'll seem more normal to you that thermaling in the same slightly you know, counterintuitive way might seem a good idea. And there are clearly people who think it works and believe in it. Um, that may be down to personal technique, the wing you've got and the way you fly. So experiment with it by all means, but at least think of it as a possibility. So if we park simple theory one, which is the big wide turn, then we we'll could look at the simple theory two, which is the tight turn, which is you know, 
understandable that it says it's going to to do it but this is where I will try to get gadgetry to work and we'll share the screen which hopefully will give me uh, pieces. that's the screen there we go should be this one and share okay right um can everyone still hear me yes no somebody yeah yeah, yeah it's um, okay, Alistair um that's in presenter mode again but oh yeah uh remind me how to fix that see me up here um, that's it. Is that better? That's it. Good. Um, so uh, we tried this earlier and found that for reasons um, I can't figure out, and neither can Mike, who's much brighter in these things than I am, um, the audio does not come through. So what I will do is explain what I'm intending to show by showing this clip. So we'll pick it up and I'll talk through it as it happens. The first bit is just a little bit of this guy who's Greg Hammerton, um, who was with Flybubble at the time this was made. Full credit to them, they make a lot of excellent videos. This one is demonstrating one particular point, which is the difference between how you turn, firstly, mainly with brakes, and secondly, with also doing a turn from the same starting point, getting round to the same position, but this time going uh, weight shift first. A little bit of faffy about the beginning. The interesting things to note for is when it comes up with the subtitle saying um, weight shift and turning, um, down at the middle and the bottom of the screen, there's a little number comes up and that's a countdown of how long it takes to complete that turn. Um, so he does it for the first one and then he does it for the second one. And then there's a thing that comes up that compares the two. So with that background, I will play this video hopefully and people will see what happens with it. This is where he's doing another bit of thing, just describing how to catch gliders when it's a little bit lively. I didn't trim this bit of the video as well as I'd like, but he's just saying stopping and driving. Now we come on to the bit, turns and weight shift. So he's describing, he's turning, he's applying right hand brake and a little bit of left. And as he's commenting, it generates lift. So the two fight against each other to some extent, and you'll see the time clock's kicking along. That's 10 seconds. This is the same thing. Lift your brakes up, weight shift first, and now apply the brake. And you see the second countdown clock coming around to point in the same direction, and you'll see weight shift led turn significantly quicker, which is really the point. With, once again, I stress, that is his particular setup. Maybe his wing is reactive, maybe his harness is reactive, there's a couple of things he does slightly differently, but it does show that on the same wing, using a different technique, in one way you can come around significantly quicker. Whether it's a full half, I don't know, but it's certainly significantly quicker by doing that method of turning. If that's the one you want to explore, then that's fine. Is it the same for everyone? Well, once again, I don't know. It depends on your wing and your harness setting and your style of flying. Um, so if, however, you've decided that the, the really slow turn isn't the most efficient one because the lift is patchy or wherever, then clearly one of the smarter things to do might be say, well, let's turn quicker. And in that case, if this method by going weight shift first gets you around quicker, let's do it. Of course, the try. Um, one of the guys who wrote books, quite a lot of books recently, one of them who wrote it is, is a guy who wrote um, Prepare to Fly. Um, Simon, Simon somebody, um, name keeps me entirely. But what he said was that what you should do is go out and do 10 turns. 10 turns break first, 10 turns weight shift only, 10 turns with the two combined, and then depending on which one you apply first, brakes and then weight shift, or weight shift and then brakes, and basically try to get a feel for which one feels right to you, and more importantly, which one turns you around quickly if that's what you want to do. Um, I've tried to do this in the past, and the main problem I have with it, and it's really simple, simple and stupid, is 
counting 10 seconds in your head, I find difficult at the best of times. Trying to do it when you're you know, concentrating on flying, avoiding other gliders and all the rest of it, you lose count or you speed up because you want to be around a bit quicker or you slow down. It's, it's difficult, um, I would say. Um, there's a way around it, which is actually quite simple. You can get uh, kitchen countdown timers. You just set it for 20 seconds, have it uh, mounted on one of your risers or a bit of Velcro, they're light, you can just have it to hand. Press the start button, it will start the countdown after 20 seconds or whatever you choose, it will send a, send a signal of beeps to you. And then you'll know that that's the amount of time it's taking you to get to that position. And then you'll know whether these turns are quicker or otherwise. If you try to do it purely subjectively, it's very hard because most of us will have a preconditioned um, idea of which one works better and you will manipulate the evidence. If you've got an independent thing that will count down 20 seconds, absolutely irrespective of what you do, then it's much harder to say, well, actually that did work better or worse or whatever. So if you're going to be actually taking this halfway seriously and trying to find out which way your wing turns better, I would strongly recommend getting a countdown timer, nice double cheap thing that you can get from kitchens particularly, which will do it. Okay. One of the things you might have noticed in that is that uh, he very definitely, in the second example, speeds up. He puts his hands right up. Um, in ordinary flying, you will be um, having some measure of break on so you can react to turbulence and just feel in contact with the wing. Noticeably, when he's about to do his turn in the second one, he gets his hands right up. I don't see any reason that should be different. Um, speaking personally, when I'm ridge soaring, I'm usually quite reluctant to have my hands fully up because it does go gnarly or bumpy or I need to control it or I want to slow down in it. I would like to be in touch with my wing. So um, even on any wing, it would make sense to say, okay, I know I'm going to turn, I want to turn quickly. So lift the hands up, especially if you've got a wrap on, undo the wrap, lift it up and then do your turning that way. So at least you're getting the benefit of increased speed into your turn, which should get you round through the turn that bit better. So uh, that's fast turn against slow turn. And of course, all of that is affected by the conditions that you're doing the turning in. Those you have to assess and work. One of the other things we need to think about though in turns is the effect of your kit. And in particular, pod harnesses. Um, pod harnesses are great I mean, from my point of view because they keep you warm and cozy and they make you feel nice and safe and enclosed and you know that that's great and <coughs> that by itself is is worth it for most of us in Scotland because it's chilly. Um, as to the aerodynamic benefits, um, I mean read a fair amount about it, its best effect is if you angle your you know, the angle that your harness sits at with the airflow and that depends on how your glider works and I think it's questionable whether most people have got it so precisely aligned that it's actually presenting the least possible frontal area. It might be into the wind, but if it points down like that, you've got the whole surface that way. And if it's too far up, you've got the surface that way. So it's only when it's absolutely right that you've got the minimum straight into wind by the minimum possible amount that's there. If you do that, you've got a bigger, bigger area. So if you have that, um, one of the things you have to remember is that you've got um, a resistance to turning. In a classic harness, um, the, the roll axis, the turning axis, comes down from the middle of the wing, basically through you in the middle of your seat. In a beginner wing or sit-up meg harness, whatever you want to call it, your, your line, your axis of roll is going through you, through your head, through your backside, and if you've got your legs tucked under, through your legs as well. So all the weight is concentrated close to the axis. So when you put your control input to the wing, the wing turns as an effect because you're connected to the wing because of the harness, you start turning and because you're closer to the roll axis, the turn will happen relatively quickly. If you're supine in a pod, then the story is quite different. On your roll axis, you'll have your feet sticking out two feet, if not more, in front of the center of the roll axis. And if you're reclining, you've got your head and upper body 
sticking a foot and a half perhaps out the back that way. So that has an effect on when you want to start turning. Um, best example to convince people of if you need it is uh, speed skaters in a spin, not speed skaters, skaters in a spin. When they go into a spin, they have their arms and legs out and they go around at a particular speed, usually relatively, you know, recognizably fast. If they bring everything in, then due to, if I remember my physics right, conservation of angular momentum, because you brought everything in, everything speeds up. So you get a very, very fast spin because everything is now closer to the axis of rotation. If you then stick your arms back out again, it slows back down again. And if you bring it back in, you'll speed back up again. And that's just the fact that because it's further out, it takes longer for all that momentum further away from the axis to actually make the turn. So if you apply that to a pod harness, then there is going to be a degree of resistance uh, to a turn. Is that going to make a difference for these things? Again, I don't know. It depends on on your harness and your setup, but purely on the grounds of physics, there must be um, a, a resistance to the turn happening. Um, to back that up, acro pilots sit up. You never see an acro pilot in a pod harness. If you do an SIV, the first thing they will tell you is sit up and tuck your legs under because you're going to be doing rapid turning maneuvers and they want that all in there so you don't get the delay that gets built in with a pot harness for your or, a, or just having your legs out in a stirrup because that slows down your ability to follow what the wing is doing. So if that applies to those kind of turns, to some extent it must also apply in even the turns we do. So if you're already sitting up because you want to go slow as you're soaring along because you want to keep in the lift band, it makes sense to keep in that tucked in position if you want to turn quicker. It's all marginal, but marginal differences, as Sky Team Cycling used to tell us, are what give you all the benefits. Well, apart from the drugs being delivered by a doctor and shady packages that we won't talk about, but basically that's, that's the position. These are small differences, but they will add up when it's marginal conditions. Okay, um, pod harness does that. Let's look at the other bit of harnesses, and this is where this bit might be a little bit controversial, which should be quite exciting. If you believe that when you are doing um, your flying, you should do it exactly in accordance with the um, EN rules and certification of your glider, and you must never take it out of certification, fine. You can stop listening now, pick us back up in about 10 minutes, and we'll, we'll go on from there. If on the other hand, you might think there might be a bit more to it, or in fact, even if you do think that's the case, maybe you should listen to what I'm going to say because some of it might be interesting for you. Um, chest straps. What we're all told um, is that chest straps are something that's important for two reasons, and you should have it set at a certain distance. For most of us, it's 42 centimeters, and that's what you should have it as, and... <coughs> <coughs> the more draconian of us would believe, have you believe that if you depart from that by anything, you are now a test pilot and you're not, you're flying in certification and you're taking huge risks with your life and everything else. Hmm. Let's have a look at that in a bit more detail. Um, we all know, I hope, that the chest strap, the amount of chest strap is open, has a major effect on how your glider behaves. It's part of the control system of your aircraft because it affects primarily how you can do your weight shift. Okay, controlling the glider. If you have a wide chest strap, wider than the standard one, you have a greater ability to effect weight shift because basically, the way I look at it is, you've got a lever, which is you sitting on the seat plate of your harness. If by leaning over that, you can then make that side of the wing go down further, you have greater authority over the weight shift, you will can apply a diff greater differential weight between one eye and the other, and you'll have greater control over what your wing does. So that sounds quite good. Um, greater leverage, 
then the more effect you have on the wing, your weight shifts will be more efficient. The wing will feel more responsive. And that sounds quite good. There is a flip side, however, <coughs> which is just as you can apply more uh, input to the wing, in bumpy air, the wing can apply more input to you. So if you encounter rough or lifting air, the wing going up and down because of the air, um, air condition of the air will have more effect on you. It will feel bumpy and rough and it will be disconcerting. Um, whether that's something you like, whether the greater control is worth the greater turbulence effect you feel by being more aware of what the air is doing is, I think, primarily a matter of either personal preference, you know, you like the extra input and you're prepared to put up with it, or potentially, um, actually in, in the early stages, is just tolerance. Um, when you started flying, it was a nice smooth air and any kind of bump was like, Boo! it was, was scary and horrible, not something you wanted. And then you get used to it and you can tolerate more and find that the bumps do actually tell you about air going up and air going down. So that's useful information. So that to that extent, the control element is to some extent a personal preference. The other major factor, of course, in chest trap setting is its effect on safety, the passive safety implication. If you consider the absolute most basic um, paragliding harness seat imaginable, which is like a child's swing, you've got two suspension points. And if one side of the wing collapses, it just drops. This side is not supported in any way, and the seat just collapses to a vertical position. Now, if you're in that seat, that's not going to be very comfortable until the wing reinflates. So um, it's sort of comfortable, in fact, it's, it's, it's not really something most of us could tolerate. So how do you get around that basic problem? Well, uh, the answer that came up with is cross bracing, which in the early days was exactly that. It was bracing that went across from the riser on one side to the bottom of the seat plate on the opposite side, and the same from that riser down to the bottom of that one. So you have cross bracing. The seat is in fact supported because you now have on either side a triangle which supports the seat on both sides. If the side collapses, off the wing collapses, that side would drop, but then because there's a triangular effect, it can only drop so far before the cross bracing catches it and stops it going down. And that's the essence of cross braking. Um, if you have a totally cross braced harness, it becomes totally unresponsive to weight shift because the cross bracing is so tight that there is no room for you to actually apply differential weight to the wing. So the wing becomes dead, unresponsive. It doesn't do weight shift and you've lost one of your control methods for your wing, but the wing will collapse as much, or if it does, it'll at least be supported you know, very quickly. That's not, you know, it's not a very good feeling, very dead feeling. So by experiment, or possibly just looking at the fact of how big people are, they came up with a standard kind of size, which is 42 centimetres, 16 inches in old money. Um, before the standards were introduced, it was a bit of a free-for-all. People designed wings as they liked. And the Germans, full credit to them and the DHV, took the lead in setting up um, a kind of standardization of how wings behave in certain circumstances. And what you need to do that is have repeatable conditions. And one of them was, what's the chest strap setting? So they went for 42 inches. And, and that was, when I started flying, 42 inches was it for everybody. And that's fine. Um, the expedient showed that, unfortunately, that wasn't the whole story. Um, 42 inches did the job, but um, the standard technique when I was learning, which was 1998, God help me, and as in this book, which was also published in 1998, um, devotes a whole two pages on how you can adjust and change the chest strap setting from fully open to fully closed. And that was simply regarded as part of the way to deal with conditions. It does say in fairness that if you have it fully open, you should only fly in smooth coastal conditions. And in between, then obviously totally closed up, that gives you no response. So in between was um, probably where it was. And this is, this gets interesting. Um, 42 was the standard which the Germans came up with. 
and that applied pretty much till getting on for 2007, 2008. What I'm going to show you now um, is uh, something that's quite interesting. This is from the manual of a wing of that vintage. It was an over rookie, and I've highlighted the bit that's interesting. The difference between left and right hang points should be between 45 and 60 centimeters. That's the manufacturer's recommendation in the manual. It was tested at 42, but the guy who presumably knows it best, the guy who built it, and it was, you know, it's an over, so Han is a very well-respected guy, is telling you that he thinks it applies better if you, if you actually have the um, chest strap, the distance between the two hang points, as between 45 and 60, which is a bit different from 42. So if we go on to the next one, this is another wing of, the, it was a Wintech Pulsar. Again, I've highlighted it. This one, although it's a large, says, the maximum, no maximum chest setting, carabiner to carabiner, should be 38 centimetres, <coughs> which is very much less than um, the 42. So clearly, you've got, even within a, a test setting of 42, you have manufacturers saying in their manuals that, in fact, we recommend a different setting. In one case, much wider, and in this case, less. So. Something funny is going on here. Um, clearly, not everyone is, is playing by the same game. Um, the manufacturer is telling you one thing is the best way to get the best out of your wing, and the, the test standard saying it's been tested and certified at a different setting, which they're not particularly recommending. Hmm, bit odd. Um, 2007 was interesting. It was the culmination of, I think, something like a seven-year battle between the DHV, who were taking the lead in setting up testing, and EN, which is the European uh, testing standards, which was setting up a testing standard. And they were arguing for uh, a difference. They didn't want to have just 42. They wanted to have um, 42 for most people, but for larger pilots and presumably larger wings, a slightly bigger one at 46. And for smaller pilots, which is below 50 kilograms in weight, then it should be 38. Um, why, why was this um, being argued about? Well, I think if you, if you like the history, and I think it is interesting, um, the DHV tests are all designed for what we might call passive safety, where if you have a complete sack of potatoes, utterly incompetent pilot, it's a measure of how the wing will react so you can tell if the pilot does absolutely nothing, this is how the wing will react if you have a 50% asymmetry collapse or incipient spin. If you do nothing, the test will show you how quickly it will return. It will turn less than 90 degrees. It will recover within a set period of time. That's the testing standards that they had. And the idea is that this is a kind of passive safety. If you have a completely useless pilot who does nothing, the wing will look after you. But what was coming clear in, in the 2000s was that there was a situation where doing nothing was actually not a good thing to do. And the standard advice, which was around it at my time, which was open it up to get some extra um, responsiveness from your wing. If it gets too bumpy, tighten the chest strap up. So if you had a nervous pilot, not want to do things, tighten up the chest strap, don't do anything, and everything will be fine. So if you're trapped in strong lift, you put it into a spiral dive, and therefore you would get down quickly and all will be well. Going to a spiral dive first time is quite disconcerting. It's noisy and there's G-forces and all the rest of it. And what became clear, because the Germans have a lot of pilots, is that there was a distressingly large number of fatalities where people go into a spiral dive and would not come out, um, or did not come out until they impacted the ground hard, usually with fatal consequences. Um, and they were, the, they were a bit of a loss to explain this. So after a lot of uh, investigation, they can, came up with conclusions that there were a number of factors, but two of them were tight chest straps are a bad thing and um, a low aspect ratio wing, i.e. Uh, an A or B as we call them now, <coughs> um, are far more prone to this. There's more to it than that, but those are the main conclusions. So in that case, if you have a 
what became a locked-in spiral, it was called, um, you needed to apply some active measures to get out of the spiral, otherwise it would just continue, or in some cases even accelerate, uh, which is pretty disconcerting if you've been a low airtime pilot and expect your wing to sort everything out for you because everything else does do nothing and the wing will sort itself out. Except for spiral dives, it didn't. So they had to rethink um, the, the distance straps to some extent. So I think that was partly why the end standard ended up with this tripartite. If you're over 80 kilograms, then it's 46. If you're between 50 and 80, it's 42, which is the standard for most people. And if you're very likely 50 kilograms and under, then it should be um, uh, the distance. And this is this is reflected. This is a BHP summary of, of that EN standard, EN 926. So you'll see test pilot is 42, horizontal distance of the riser attachment points, but it's reduced if it's less than 50 kilograms, and if it's more than 80, up to 46. So far, so straightforward. Right. Um, unfortunately, because um, people are, uh, just keep, your, keep that in mind because it's there. Because people were growing up with this uh, what's tradition, you might call it, or understanding that if you wanted better response to your glider, you could slacken up your chest strap. And lots of people did. Um, lots of people still don't check their chest straps. And some people do open it up to get better results. Sometimes with uh, bad results, because if you overdo it, then yes, it will radically change how your wing behaves. Um, and you need to be wary of that. Absolutely, I'm not, I'm not arguing about that. But one of the things that's interesting is, let's have a look at um, what the BHPA say about it. This is what was in the BHPA documents in 2007. And I know that because it was quoted and copied on a post from Facebook, not Facebook, on the PG forum at that time. It actually doesn't appear in the BHP papers anymore. I was looking for this and I asked for information about it and I was directed to quite a helpful document which says EN standards about wings explained all the configurations for A, B and C wings and all the rest of it. But the bit about harness things was apparently removed or not included when the EN standard was updated in 2013. So finding anything about it in BHP papers is actually quite hard. And if you start looking at things that are around, one of the things you have at the moment, and I'm quoting you from the BHP handbook third edition, if you want the page number I can happily provide it to you, is um, standard distance is, get this, usually about 40 centimeters, which is not terribly precise if you've got an EN standard which says it's actually 42, 38 if you're light and 46 if you're bigger. But that's the current edition of the pilot handbook, which is not totally in tune with, with what we've got here. So it's not, not particularly helpful that that's what's happening. Um, so I went looking for more things about the BHP, and as I, say, I, I couldn't find very much. And the only other thing I managed to find was um, a report on safety matters from 2009 Skywings, um, which doesn't print out very well on the screen, but this is the, the relevant point. It repeats what we've just discussed about chest settings, and then it comes out with a fairly severe health warning. Setting the carabiner distance wider than the certified settings means you're a test pilot, and you should expect considerable increased difficulties in recovering the wing to normal flight in the event of a collapse. Recovery may in fact be impossible, especially if the height is limited and you're not or extremely well practiced in SIV arts. Um, so, that's the, that's the very strong exhortation you've been given to stick to those. And this is the phrase that's interesting. All test flights are carried out at this setting. You know, well, that's interesting. And um, being an inquisitive kind of person, I thought that's, that's useful to know. So at least you can all rely on that. And then I looked at some test reports and this is where it gets interesting. Um, two of the main testing houses are the DHV. And if you look at the DHV test report of any glider, I've looked at getting on for two dozen now. Nowhere in the test report does it tell you what the chest strap setting was when they tested that wing. So 
this thing that's so important and there's an EN standard about, but DHV report doesn't actually tell you what it was. You think, well, it's Germanic, they must be doing it that way, but it must be tested like that. That's bound to be the case. <coughs> the other main testing houses are turquoise, um, who I have a lot of respect for. Anyone who does test piloting of wings, I've got huge respect for. But let's have a look at two quite recent um, test reports. This one is from this year. It's an Alpha 7, which is a, a nice A-wing. And I hope you can see the bits I've highlighted. Distance between the risers for the guy who's light, 70, 70 kilograms in flight. So 70 kilograms should be 42. Distance between the risers, 40. Interesting. Let's look at the top of the weight range, same wing. Guy 110 kilograms, so very definitely over 80. So it should be 46. And what's it at? 48. So the testing house in the test certificate that you're relying on is testing and certifying this wing, not at the EN standard. So if you were simply following what the VHPA safety notice said in the Sky Wings and said, I will follow the EN standards, you're then flying a non-certified wing and you're a test pilot again. Does this happen elsewhere? Well, yeah, here's the next one. This is a rush from 2018. Um, I'm just picking wings that I've come across and noticed it. This is a less of a weight range, it's a B wing. And this one, 75 kilograms in flight. So certainly about 50, less than 80. And the distance between is 44, not 42. But here's the interesting thing. When he jumps up to 95 at the top of the weight range, it should go up. And what's it at? 44, same one. So again, what you're getting tested at on the official certification, this is your test report online that you can look at, is not in a claim with the EM standards. If you just think, I'll be okay if I put it at 42 or 46 or whatever you are. So interesting. So you're finding that there are, and this is another one, which is just thrown in for the novelty value. Um, it seems to be a bit ha hazard. This one is at a higher weight cut, is measured at 43. So we've got an odd number creeping in there. It's not even in, in twos or fours or allowing for two degrees for being wider. So the actual test document from your turquoise is different from what you might expect just by saying full certification. Um, and at least they tell you DHV, they could be doing the same or more or worse. I don't know because they don't tell you. So a degree of caution therefore has to come in about um, these, these distances. Um, I'm not saying you know, there's anything underhand going on here, but what it does suggest is that the setting is not as absolutely precisely important as is being made out because these are wings that are certified without problems at different from the you know, the officially sanctioned ones because you're not they're not according to the EN, CN that they're supposed to be tested to. Interesting, to say the least. And it's not entirely logical. Um, let's take the example, I fly my wing, I'm 79 kilograms, so I'm at a 42 setting. So that's, that's good. And then Christmas comes along, I have a good lunch, somebody buys me a pair of heavier boots, and I've got some winter clothing on, so suddenly I'm at 81 kilograms. Nothing else has changed. I've got the same wing, I've got the same harness, I'm two kilograms heavier, but suddenly the only ap appropriate setting, if you follow the dogma, is four centimetres wider? Really? Um, for, for a small difference, you know, when it's in slabs like that, it, it just doesn't make sense. So if you apply all that to it, I think you have to come to the conclusion that realistically, um, the standard is there to get people to be sensible about the chest strap setting, not that it's an absolute, you must not deviate by 10 thousandths of an inch or you will immediately die. But to try to keep you doing sensible things. Um, the background to the safety notice matters may be helpful. Um, it's not often in accident inquiries, fatal ones, that you can assign a definite cause to um, kit. And very definitely in that year, there was one where you could do exactly that because the pilot, uh, when he crashed in, um, had his chest strap set, if you can call it that, fully open at 65. Um, which is 
more than 50% more than the recommended city for them. And understandably, when his wing collapsed, it was went into a violent cascade, which he, in the words of the report, lacked the skills to deal with. So that's clearly what prompted the 2009 notice saying, there's a fad for having your chest strap open, let's not do this. And I'm not suggesting for a second that anyone goes to those lengths. But what I am suggesting is that given what we're seeing here, I think there is room to allow for chest strap experimentation within a reasonable level, four, five degrees. If you open it out that much, a wing that you may find have been dull and unresponsive may become much easier to weight shift without radically affecting its safety provisions. I think that's working. If you find your wing is a slug and does not res respond well to weight shift, change your chest strap setting is, I think, a reasonable thing to consider doing within reason. And just so I show I'm not going completely out on a limb on this, uh, one of the most recent books about it is Paragliding the Beginner's Guide, which was published just last year. And even in that, which is after all this stuff, it says, and I quote, tightening the chest strap by more than about four centimeters will dampen the movements, but will also mean you can't weight shift so effectively. Loosening the chest strap by more than four centimeters will cause the glider to act more sensitively towards weight shift. The turn may happen faster and the pilot will feel more movement and turbulent air. So there's a very much up-to-date um, manual book for beginners, actively suggesting that notwithstanding EN standards, you should experiment up to a certain amount with your chest strap. I think what I've concluded from thinking about all this is it's a little bit, in a way, like a tennis racket. You've got a tennis racket which is strung up tightly. All the strings are exactly the same tension. But if you apply a tennis ball at the different points over the tennis racket face, you don't get the same result. There will be a sweet spot where the ball comes out sweet and true and goes where you want it. And I think for any given combination of wing, pilot, harness, and chest strap stretching, there will be a sweet spot where things work. Your wing is not sluggish and it's not careening out of control in tight turns. It just works. And you have to find that out for yourself because you might have the same wing as somebody else. You might even have the same harness as them. You probably won't be exactly the same weight and you probably won't have the same chest strap setting. So those are worth experimenting with. I appreciate that is not standard advice. Obviously, the DHP position is follow the EN standard, and that's the only way it's possibly allowed. I think realistically, given what I've shown you here, um, the test house you don't stick to it. So making sure your wing is flying within certification involves rather more than just sticking to 42 centimetres if you're between 50 and 80 kilograms four or more than that and four less if you're under it. it it's not, it can't be as, as black and white binary as that, I'm afraid. Not in my book. Okay, so that's a little, little bit of an interesting digression. That's the kind of spot of work. If you've tuned out up to this point, it's time to tune back in again because the chest trap setting does an effect. And I think it's worth at least thinking about whether that could have an effect on how well things are going to work. Anyway, when's the last time you did it? And another small thing on chest straps. Um, if you have a flight deck that's not integral to your harness, one that you bolt on additionally, or indeed a front mounted reserve, remember that those tend to be mounted where? Between your risers, your myons. That's what they snag onto. If you're anything like my wing, um, I find that the weight of the instruments means that your uh, flight deck will tend to flop over and not be in an upright position where you can actually read the thing unless the straps are quite tight. So I think you might find a number of cases that the thing that's actually actually determining your chest strap setting, i.e. how far apart your risers are when you're flying, may be your flight deck straps or indeed your front mounted reserve attachments and not the actual chest strap. So that's worth a quick check just to see you might not actually be flying it as you thought you were because that's not the thing that's actually taking taking the strain and holding it in that position. Interesting little thought just to um, bear in mind if you have got a, a flight deck that is not actually built into part of the harness itself. Right. 
conscious times moving on i've got one more thing to say which is again about turning funnily enough and this is um it's got different names but this is quite fun um this this bunch calls it call it break shifting can you see the picture on the screen yeah hope so hope so anyway standard braking suggests that you simply pull the brake line down, as in the picture on the left. The brake shifting or cross braking, if you like, means that you take the uh, brake handle towards the center of your body. Okay. Uh, has everyone got that, that picture? Yeah. I'll just go back to stop screen sharing. Um, people with me so far? Yep. Good. Okay. Um, what's the point in this? Um, well, the brake that you have is not a single point. It's a single point, single line in your hands, but it then spreads out into a fan. So it attaches to the center of your wing, right the way out to the tip of the wing at the rear leading edge. And the interesting thing about uh, having that arrangement is that if you pull it down, it will pull down the same amount on all parts of the wing. But we have this highly sophisticated audiovisual tool. It's it's a well, it's a garden rake. Okay. And if you pull it down, it will all go down like this. The interesting thing is if you take this and change how you hold it, and then instead of pulling it down, you just change it to one side, lo, what happens? One side is pulled more than another because you're changing the amount of pull that's being done in that way. That's what's happening with that brake shifting or cross braking effect. You're pulling the wing across. And what that means is there is more brake being applied at the tip of the wing. And because it's pointed down, that catches the air more and you're applying less braking to the center of the wing, which is the bit that's flying along and uh, giving you lift if you uh, apply brake in the center of the wing. So it should, and does with my wing anyway, result in a tighter turn. The wingtip, if you like, hooks into the air better. It hooks in and you turn around quicker. And I think that's, that's quite interesting. It depends on your wing's geometry. It depends on how the brake fan goes, how far up it goes, how much it goes. Clearly it has an effect uh, on my wing. If your brake fan comes out lower or further up, it will have a different effect. It depends also, I think, on the arc of the wing that you have. <coughs> probably the more arc, the probably the more effect it has. What's interesting, however, is it means you can have another way of turning tighter, which if you're looking to turn tightly in a wing, in a, a ridge lift situation, or if you're trying to thermal tightly, then it's a way of turning more quickly, um, which is, I think, useful. Um, some of the pilots in comp discussions refer to, you may have heard it as um, being referred to as tip steering because their wings are so long that uh, they they end up with effectively almost a two brake system where one brake uh, seems to work on the tip and one works in the centre and you can operate them almost independently and so you'll, you'll find reference in some of their discussions to tip steering the wing, partly because those wings are so long, they turn really badly. So anything you can do to improve their turning abilities is, is probably better. But it may well work on your wing. And if you're looking to improve your turning um, with effects, that's another thing to consider. Um, does everyone understand the basics of that? It's, it's a bit novel. Um, it's not something that comes up every day. Um, I have tried it and it works with me and it may well work with you. So I think it's at least worth a go. As I said, the point of all this is to point out things that may make a difference to you on all these aspects, which may affect turns and therefore how much height you lose. So that's um, the sort of last major comment I make on types of things. So let's think, Re quick recap, when you're going to do a turn, so what are we going to do? Are we going to wait straight? Are we going to, where are we going to turn has got to be considered? We've got to decide is it weight shift first or brake first or both together or do we slow down or speed up before the turn 
do we increase our drag by dropping our legs and adopting a more upright position in the harness or not? Um, is that all going to work? Um, if you turn tightly, there will be the effect that you're thrown out on the outside of the wing, like a, you know, a bit like a water skier going around to turn. You're taking a bigger arc than the wing and you're heavier. So you'll swing around, you'll have that energy, which will then convert back into height as you come out of the turn. That's another factor that can be a factor in how much turn you're going to have. So there's quite a lot going on in each and every turn. And that's what you're supposed to do at each end of, of every beat along the ridge, which is quite a lot to take in and think about. But the point is, if you can work out which one of these things might work for you, see which ones you like the feel of, see if you could change your kit to make it work better for you, because it is unique to you, then you may find that you have these tips which will make you turn better, lose less height on your turns, preserve the height you've already got, and thus be a height miser. Um, I've talked quite a long time, preserving uh, height during XC flights is probably another whole topic, which don't want to engage on here, but those are things that you can work on in ridge lift if you're doing nothing else. There's a, something you can actually focus on, work on doing this to make life better for your height retention and making the best use of it. So your best place to either fly more if you're soaring or be better positioned to get a clean getaway without milling around in a messy thermal with lots of other pilots at the same height. So try those, see if they work. They may not. Um, accept responsibility that if you're going outside the bounds of you know, your strict certification, then you're probably big enough and ugly enough to cope with that. But I think it's worth a try. Um, happy practicing. Um, all I'd say is, if you do find it worth you, try not to get above me and look down on me too often as we go. And that's me. Um, that's the Hype Miser. Uh, questions, anybody? Anybody wants to discuss? If people are interested, I'll happily put links to anything if they want to study the full video or how it works, then I'm happy to do that because you know, it's examples from other sources, people who've done these things and clearly made them work. So it's worth a go, in my opinion. Okay, that's me. Hi, Alistair. Many thanks for that. Um, I think anything that makes us think as we're as traveling and flying open up, especially in the next thing, has got to be a good thing. I certainly didn't think there was that much information out there about uh, chest harnesses, but uh, that's what happens when you get a lawyer on the case. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but certainly in terms of height misering, there is certainly nothing more annoying than gradually sinking out and others are still flying. So any way of um, staying up has got to be a good thing. Yeah. Let's face it, if you're lightweight on a floaty glider, you're going to beat us anyway, but you can at least give them a go for their money. Yeah. <laughs> so any, any questions for Alistair? Excellent. Right, for information, the XC League starts on Friday, apparently. So take it easy, everyone. And um, this is probably going to be the, the last until last LLSC evening until next winter. So uh, without further ado, thank you very much, Graham. Thank you very much, Alistair. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. And um, yeah, see you on a hill sometime soon. Cool. Take it easy. Cheers. Fun. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Cheers. <laughs>